I've chosen the, as the topic of this workshop the purchase and sale of residential real estate. Uh, the reason that I've chosen this topic is because we want to examine all of the aspects of the purchase and sale of residential real estate. And if you take all of these aspects together, they constitute a virtually perfect intersection between the application of the principles of real property law and the application of the principles of contract law. Because what is being sold is residential real estate, so we will assume for our purposes it's a house and a piece of land. And what is being sold is all of the right title and interest to the residential real estate together with all of the conditions which, to which the real estate is subject to. And that these conditions are uh, the, the right title and interest to the property, the uses and the, for the right and title to use and enjoyment and the ownership interest which the new owner will be purchasing is based on real property law but the conditions for the use and enjoyment of the property and the relationship with outside third parties is based on contract law. The other reason I chose residential real estate transactions to focus on is because these are the kinds of uh, big ticket transactions that people deal with in their daily lives, uh, or maybe not daily lives, they deal with in their lives, and when you purchase a house or a piece of real estate in, to live in, Obviously, it's a purchase that uh, will have uh, major consequences for the rest of your life, and these consequences will include uh, primarily a financial dimension, but also a dimension of living in the community, uh, establishing contacts, uh, have a professional dimension on your life. And so the question that arises is, how are these real estate residential transactions arranged? And what do you have to know about the law and about the functioning of real estate transactions in order to be fully prepared? And of course, as a secondary issue connected with these workshops, what is the terminology that you have to be able to use uh, if you're involved in translations or interpretations to make sure that all the parties are talking on the same page? So let me briefly describe the number of contracts that are involved in a traditional uh, purchase and sale of residential real estate and you will see how multi-dimensional is the entire process and of course each of these contracts and each of these conditions we will be examining individually during the course of the workshop so in the first instance the seller of the real estate who must be the owner obviously in order to sell the real estate the seller will almost always sign a contract with a real estate agency which will represent him at this point, then you have the uh, concept of principal and agent, so you have an agency contract in effect. The terms and conditions of the contract are determined by the terms and conditions of the listing agreement, but the contract itself involves the purchase and sale of real property. So if you're determining how the contract will be put into effect, you have to take, a con take into consideration all the principles affecting real property law. Now this is just the first step. At the time the seller puts the property on the market, the seller is going to have a number of contractual obligations with a number of other people with interests in the property. For example, a very common obligation is a leasehold interest. So the seller may have the property leased to somebody else. And the buyer of the property, who is going to become the new owner, will take the property subject to the terms and conditions of the lease. So if the buyer wants to immediately occupy the property, they cannot do so to the extent that someone else has a leasehold interest for the use and occupancy and enjoyment of the property. Uh, the seller is undoubtedly, uh, not undoubtedly, but it's most likely the seller will have financial obligations relating to their ownership of the property. These financial obligations in the first instance usually involve a, a mortgage. It may even be more than one mortgage. So you have the purchase mortgage, the first mortgage, and maybe a second mortgage was taken out. Now the buyer is going to these uh, uh, mortgage obligations, as well as the, as the leasehold interest, these obligations run with the land. The buyer takes the property subject to the owner's obligations. So there are two things. Either the seller gets rid of the previous obligations, or the buyer purchases the property subject to the existing obligations. In most instances, for example, a leasehold interest, the buyer will purchase the property subject to the existing obligations because it's very difficult to buy out someone who has a leasehold interest in the property, although theoretically it can be done. 
Uh, as regards the financial obligations, the buyer will expect the seller to get rid of to eliminate the financial obligations prior to the purchase of the property. So the seller will have financial agreements with uh, banks for mortgages. The seller may have entered into other agreements, for example, creating easements, rights of way, uh, a number of other agreements relating to the usage of the property. Uh, and the seller may have also entered into agreements with regard to uh, taxes, tax agreements and judgments, for example, uh, a seller may own money to may owe money, excuse me, owe money to someone, and that person will agree to accept an interest in the real estate and will put a lien in the property. So when the buyer purchases the property, it's subject to all these contractual arrangements between the seller and third parties, and all of these arrangements have to be dealt with individually prior to the buyer obtaining what they want, which is uh, full and absolute ownership interest in the property. Now, from the buyer's point of view, since most buyers do not have the money to purchase the property outright, the buyer is going to be going out and seeking their own financing arrangements with regard to the purchase of the property. So the buyer will enter into a, con a series of contractual arrangements in order to obtain a mortgage loan from the bank. The buyer may also have to enter into some private contractual arrangements with regard to the down payment, and it is even possible that the buyer will have future uses of the property in mind and will be negotiating with people who may be using the property in the future and may even sign a contract giving them options with regard to the purchase of the property. So the number of contractual uh, aspects related to the purchase and sale of the property is actually virtually unlimited. You can have up to 20, 25 contracts involved in a single purchase and sale agreement. And all of these contracts need to be discussed individually and agreements between the buyer and the seller need to be made uh, in connection with the purchase and sale of the property. How do the buyer and the seller come to agreements on all these conditions? Well, they sign an agreement. I have one in my hand here. Uh, there are a large number of, an unlimited number of such agreements because the agreements can be no, uh, negotiated. They sign an agreement for the purchase and sale of real estate. The title of the agreement is not important. It may be called a purchase sale agreement, an agreement to sell real estate, an agreement to buy real estate. What is important is the legal effect of the agreement. Now, if you look at it, this is a very unusual, atypical situation because the seller is the owner of the property. After they sign the agreement to purchase, a large number of these contractual obligations have to be wrapped up. The process usually takes about two months. It can take three months. It theoretically can be done very quickly in less than two months, but it's very difficult. During those two months, the seller continues to be the owner of the property but the buyer is making concrete financial obligations and arrangements for the purchase of the property and may be entering into a series of other contracts. Therefore, the buyer's financial future is already connected with the purchase of the property. And so the, the, the question that arises is who owns the property during this interim period after the purchase and sale agreement is signed and prior to the closing or settlement when the purchase and sale agreement is consummated? And the answer is that the, if conflicts arise, if disputes arise, that the courts have to apply what are called equitable principles and that the purchaser of the property obtains an equitable interest in the property upon signing the contract and the seller of the property contains the continuing legal interest in the property. Now the possibility of disputes in these kinds of arrangements is very high. I'm, I am just estimating there are, I don't think there are uh, statistics available on this, but based on my personal experience and my estimation would be that when you sign an agreement to sell real estate, probably about 80% of the time the agreement goes through in accordance with the wishes of the party. By the way, one of the things that's good about uh, purchases and sales of real estate is if, the, if everything goes according to plan, everybody's happy. The seller is happy because they got paid the amount of money that was agreed on for purchasing the property. The buyer is happy because they now have their new piece of property and they paid what they agreed to pay. And the real estate agent is happy because they get paid their commission. And of course the banks are paid off and banks always get paid. So the banks are happy too because they got paid all the additional charges that they're going to charge. And everybody's happy. And probably about 80% of the time in real estate transactions, everybody is happy at the end.
However, conflicts arise, and these conflicts can concern title, they can concern uh, somebody else who, who, who wants to negotiate uh, additional conditions to their contract, keeping in mind that they have some bargaining power with regard to the property. They can concern uh, interim damage to the property during the period, and uh, also they can concern defects to the property, which are discovered after the uh, after the signing of the agreement to sell real estate. I might mention that right up front, just to give you an example of how, uh, because this is a fairly common problem. When people purchase real estate, obviously they cannot conduct an entire inspection of the plumbing, the roofing, uh, the condition of the foundations of the property prior to signing this agreement, because if they did so, they would have to conduct these inspections on every piece of property that they were considering buying. And these, these inspections have to be done by professionals and are very expensive. In addition, it's unlikely that a seller is going to allow someone to come in and conduct an intrusive inspection of their property when they don't even know that the purchaser is really going to purchase it or not. So these inspections are put off until this interim phase, and the inspections take place after the contract is signed. And what the inspections reveal may create serious problems between the buyer and the seller because the buyer may find out that the property has structural damage, which he was not aware of, and may want to renegotiate the price. The seller, of course, is going to say, you signed the agreement, you agreed to pay the price, you saw the house, and you bought the house as is. So these kinds of disagreements arise uh, uh, frequently enough. I don't know the percentage of cases, maybe 5%, maybe 7%, maybe 10% of the cases. And then you have problems. And the question is, can you resolve these problems so that the deal will go through to the end? Uh, another problem, uh, common problem, is financing. It may turn out that the buyer is not able to obtain the financing to purchase the house. This is a very uh, uh, interesting situation in light of the financial crisis, which arose from the prime mortgages. Because until 2008, buyers were getting financing without even being credit worthy. So every buyer who signed an agreement to buy a house had no problem getting loans from the bank because they just walked in and the bank told them, sign here. And they would even pay up to 100% of the purchase price, which was unheard of previously. Uh, of course, the negative side is that the mortgages that the banks were giving to the uh, purchasers uh, contained very disadvantageous conditions. But since the purchasers needed the money, they were not in a position to bargain. Today, the uh, problem regarding financing has changed dramatically because the banks were left holding so many mortgages that were, uh, did not have sufficient security for them, and they've lost billions of dollars on these mortgages, these so-called prime mortgages. And as a result, today the banks are much tougher with regard to granting credit. And the problem again is that when the purchaser signs the agreement to buy the real estate, they have not yet made the financing arrangements with the bank. And so you may have financing problems arise. And the question that arises is what happens if a buyer signs the agreement to buy real estate, has every good faith intention to purchase the property, but cannot raise the money? So this is another issue which is arising more often uh, as we speak today. And the answer to the question is what happens depends on what the agreement says. But the problem is that the parties in their rush to obtain an agreement don't always think about these things and they don't always properly negotiate these terms and conditions in the agreement uh, which they are signing. A uh, related issue is when and if lawyers should get involved. This creates a lot of problems because the real estate agents don't want lawyers involved because their argument is that the lawyers will actually obstruct the transaction. Uh, and they, they make this argument with some justification because if a potential purchaser takes the agreement to their lawyer, their lawyer will always have changes to protect the purchaser, changes with regard to latent defects, for example, because that's, a, that's another issue that arises. But this issue arises after the purchase of the property, is what happens when the property has what are called latent defects and the property begins to, uh, two years, three years down the road, you begin to have problems. Is the seller, does the seller still have responsibility for these problems, or is the liability pl placed on the buyer? But the short answer is that if this issue is discussed and dealt with in the agreement, it will be much easier in the event that the issue arises later. And as I have said to you, this issue does arise uh, more often than, than people would like. Okay, problems with uh, 
uh, gases seeping into the house. And the question is, did the seller know that these gases were seeping into the house when they sold the house? Or did the buyer purchase the house subject to the possibility that these gases may seep in? Very, very interesting and complicated area of the law. Very much dependent on the actual factual situation. And by the way, to bring the uh, real estate law up to date to the current time, uh, today in, in real estate they are engaging in what is called fracking. And in fracking the oil and gas companies are coming on to private real estate and they are taking oil and gas out of the shale uh, sandstone arrangements which are underneath the ground. And they have very special arrangements. Now in order to get to those minerals underneath the ground they have to sign an agreement with the owner of the real estate. And the question is what are the rights of the oil company to exploit the land which is owned by the, uh, uh, the owner of the real estate. And that's a big issue. That's a, a big issue and it's a new issue which is arising. And the second question that arises is who will be responsible for the subsequent damage to the real estate which is caused by this fracking. Because there is, there is a, the, a great fear and even beginning to be reported cases that people are having problems with structural damage to their house the infiltration of gases into their house because of the poor fracking policies. And so a seller of a house may sell the property because they are afraid or they are starting to have received signals that there will be problems related to the fracking. And the question is, must they disclose this information to the buyer or are they allowed to sell the property without disclosing the information? Well, obviously a seller is not going to want to say uh, oh, the reason I'm selling this house is because I'm afraid that poisonous gases might seep in, right? And so the seller is going to uh, have to protect himself in, 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 in some way from, that, uh, from potential liability further down the road. Uh, all of these things should be an illustration of the massive amount of uh, issues that can arise in the purchase and sale of real estate. And then we have to examine the final closing of settlement where all of these interests must be settled at one time. It's a relatively complicated process, although it's also, uh, if you understand the entire transaction, the closing is not difficult to understand. If you don't understand the entire transaction, the closing will look like uh, people are speaking Chinese. Uh, and so finally, we will, we will end the workshops with a, uh, an actual closing of a uh, piece of residential real estate. Uh, final comment in, this, in, in my introductory comments, uh, in order to examine these issues properly, we will deal with several different case studies and we will start from the beginning and go through till the end of the transaction. So we will be examining two or three case studies at the same time as we go along. And that's how this workshop will look and um, now we can proceed to the actual uh, specific aspects of the workshop beginning with an investigation of what are real property interests under uh, Anglo-Saxon legal principles.